always like speaking after lunch because everybody's so wide awake. <laughs> wow. Oh. First of all, I want to tell you sincerely that I have been looking forward to this particular event for months. Uh, I have the good fortune to travel and speak to corporations around the world. Uh, I've spoken to Kimberly Clark, Pratt & Whitney Jet Engines, the uh, Million Dollar Round Table. And it's wonderful to go and work with corporations to try and improve their corporate culture. But I'm excited about this because what I know is that hopefully what I share with you today is going to go out and touch a whole lot more lives. And I also want to say that I really admire what you are doing by being a member of the SAMS process because it is so great for you to take responsibility for becoming better leaders and your schools can't help but follow. I once heard someone say that, you know, you don't raise morale. Morale trickles down from the top. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Now, I hope everybody got a complaint-free bracelet. If not, you can pick one up on your way out, and I'll be talking to you about what those are about. In 2006, I handed out these little bracelets at a church I was uh, ministering to in Kansas City, Missouri. Before I was done, people were calling me asking for bracelets. The idea was very simple. I was teaching a class on prosperity. And what I find is that people say they want more in their life, and yet they ironically complain about everything they already have. Wayne Dyer says, if you want more, why would you, if you're not happy with what you've got, why in the world would you want more? So one of the things we've got to do is to begin to appreciate what we have, because as we know, what we appreciate expands in our life. So I handed out these 250 bracelets. Before I know it, the church is getting inundated with phone calls. We started a nonprofit called A Complaint Free World. You'll see it stamped onto your bracelets. And we have sent out over 10 million bracelets to 106 countries. Now, this took off on its own. I was contacted by a publishing organization and asked to speak to them, and they wanted to title my talk, How to Create Your Own Worldwide Phenomenon. <laughs> and I said, that's a great title, but I can't deliver it because I have no idea how this took off. And I've tried to isolate why this one particular idea has become such a big thing, and I think I've identified it. And here are the two reasons on the screen. Number one, there is too much complaining in the world. If you agree, say yes. yes. And number two, the world isn't the way we would like it to be. If you agree, say yes. yes. Here's the thing. The two are correlated. We are so busy complaining about, talking about, kvetching about, griping about everything in our lives, we're perpetuating all of these challenges and all of these difficulties. So what we've got to do is to begin to focus on what we're happy about and what we're grateful for. Now, it's really interesting because the most common question, one of the more common questions people ask me is, what does it mean to complain? I was sitting at lunch with some people today, and I was explaining that yesterday I flew from Kansas City to Minneapolis. When I got to Minneapolis, the uh, airport was socked in, and so they couldn't fly me here to San Diego. They ended up flying me to Santa Ana, and I rented a car and drove down here. Now, let me ask you a question. Did I just complain? No, I heard some yeses, though, and that's OK. See, I want to make the point that we're confused about what a complaint is. The dictionary defines complain as to express grief, pain, or discontent. OK, now, it makes sense on occasion to express grief, pain, or discontent. One of the things that I want to be very clear about is I'm not asking you to shut up and suck up whatever the world sends your way. Nothing could be further from the truth. And the reason that I feel that this resonates so well with the SAMS organization is that becoming a complaint-free person is about learning to develop healthy communication skills. So a complaint is to express grief, pain, or discontent. If you think it, it's free. Don't worry about it. But what you're going to find is, through this process, as you stop uttering complaints, your mind is going to shift, and you'll literally become a happier, more positive person. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Complaining, <laughs> complaining is really funny. I like to say complaining is like bad breath. 
you notice it when it comes out of somebody else's mouth. <laughs> but not so much when it comes out of your own. It is not complaining. Let me say this again. It is not complaining to speak directly and only to the person who can resolve the issue. It is not complaining to speak directly and only to the person who can resolve the issue. What we tend to do, though, is we go and talk to everybody else. If we have a problem with our spouse, we complain to our friends. If we have a problem at work, we complain to our spouse, and then we can't understand why our life doesn't get better. I loved Susan's book this morning, Fierce Conversations. Becoming a complaint-free person is about having those fierce conversations. It's about having those uncomfortable conversations and speaking to the person who can actually resolve the issue instead of dealing with it forever. I was speaking in Denver a while back, and the driver that picked me up, Denver, all right. <laughs> We could get totally sidetracked right here, so we're not going to let that happen. The driver who picked me up at the airport and took me to the hotel said, you're in luck. This is one of the most beautiful hotels in Denver. It's a five-star, four-diamond hotel. You're going to absolutely love it. And he was right. It was, a, it was a beautiful hotel. We got there. I went inside. I unpacked. And as I love to do whenever I get to a new city, I just went and walked around the city, you know, to feel the energy. And so I'm walking around the city, and then I go back to my room, and I change clothes, and I go down to the gym, and I work out, and then I go back to my room, and I change clothes, and I go to dinner. So I'm in and out of my room several times. About 10 o'clock that night, I go to my room, and I'm getting ready for bed, and I hear this noise on the other side of the wall. And the noise is going, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak. It's not what you're thinking. <laughs> no, see, my hotel was on the sixth floor, and the building next door was five stories high, and it had one of those giant exhaust fans on the top, and it had a rusty spot. And it would go, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak, whoa, squeak. So what does the no complaint guy do in a situation like this? I went downstairs and I talked to the people at the front desk. And I said, you're probably not aware of this, but by the way, that's a wonderful way to start a fierce conversation. You're probably not aware of this, but. So I said to them, you're probably not aware of this, but the building next door has a fan and it squeaks and I've got to do a speech in the morning. They couldn't have been nicer. They moved me to the other side of the hotel. They put me in a nicer suite. It was wonderful. Now, in the past, I would have handled this differently, I have to tell you. I would have called my mother. <laughs> Can you believe this? Nicest hotel in Denver. I'll show them. I'll stay in the room. <laughs> You're laughing because you do this. You stay in difficult, uncomfortable situations, and you go and you gripe and complain to all of your friends, and then it doesn't get better. And in a little while, I'm going to explain to you why you complain. Because people only complain for one of five reasons. But remember, it is not complaining when somebody comes to you to express a situation and to tell you. And it's certainly in your roles, there are going to be challenges at the school and people are going to come and talk to you. And that is not just another complaint. That is telling you things that you need to know. You need to appreciate people for doing that. Eckhart Tolle, in his wonderful book, A New Heaven and a New Earth, says, complaining is not to be confused with informing someone of a mistake or deficiency so that it can be put right. And to refrain from complaining doesn't necessarily mean putting up with bad service, quality, or behavior. There is no ego in telling the waiter your soup is cold and needs to be heated up if you stick to the facts, which are always neutral. How dare you serve me cold soup? That's complaining. Most complaining has a how dare you do this to me tone to it. Now, why is it bad to do it to me? Because I'm the center of the universe, don't you know? And you're the center of the universe. You're the center of your own universe. And so when something transpires, you tend to think and take it personally. 
Now, I am originally from South Carolina, okay? In the South, I want you to know that we are famous for our hospitality. We are nice to everybody down South. Now, it's easy to be nice to everybody when you don't tell anybody the truth. I can't tell you how many times we would go to dinner and the waiter would come up to my mother and say, how's your meal? And my mom would say, it's just fine. And as soon as the waiter would walk away, she'd look at me and say, I ordered sweet tea, this is unsweet. Or she'd say, I ordered my steak medium, this about burnt. And I would say, mom, do you see a waiter uniform on me? Who should she be talking to? The waiter, and that's what we've got to do. Identify those waiters in our lives, the people who really can resolve the issue and make them better. So, what's wrong with complaining? What's wrong with complaining? Well, I'll share with you a number of things. Number one, here's the biggest problem with complaining. It keeps you focused on the problem rather than looking for solutions. I want you to think about how many meetings you have and how many of them are there to resolve a problem. In fact, chances are you wouldn't have many meetings if you weren't trying to resolve problems. So what do we do when we have a problem? We get together and we talk about the problem. And we talk about the problem. And we talk a little bit about a solution and then boom, we're right back to the problem. Instead of talking about the problem, talk about how will it be when the problem is resolved. How will your life be? How will the situation be? And when you do that, when you start with the end in mind, it's amazing how quickly the middle steps just sort of fill in for themselves. One of my favorite stories is about two construction workers. They get together for lunch one day. And they're sitting on the job site, and the first one opens his lunch box, and he looks inside and goes, oh, a meatloaf sandwich. I hate meatloaf sandwiches. So his friend doesn't say anything. Next day, same two guys sit down. First one opens his lunch box, looks inside, pulls out a sandwich. He goes, oh, another meatloaf sandwich. His friend is quiet. Third day, same two guys, sit down for lunch, first one opens his lunch box and goes, I've had it. Day in and day out, it's the same thing. Meatloaf sandwich, meatloaf sandwich, meatloaf sandwich, I want something else. And his friend says, why don't you ask your wife to make you something else? And the guy goes, I make my own lunch. <laughs> Do you get nothing else from what I say today? Let it be an understanding that you make your own lunch. You make your own lunch by the thoughts that you think as evidenced by the words that you speak. Your thoughts create your life, but your, wor your words indicate what you're thinking. Let me say that again. Your thoughts create your life, but your words indicate what you're thinking. And when you were sitting there just talking about it, talking about the challenge, talking about the challenge, you're slathering mayonnaise on a meatloaf sandwich. And you're serving it up to yourself. Complaining keeps you focused on the problem. Complaining is also damaging to your health. There has been a lot of research that has been done on this. You know, we hear this term, my mother used to say, I talk a lot about my mom, by the way, whom I love very much. My mom used to talk about my grandmother, and she would say, she's so psychosomatic. She's so psychosomatic. I had no idea what she was talking about. I was like six. She's so psychosomatic. And I would say, well, mom, what does that mean? She thinks she's sick all the time. But she is sick all the time, Mom. That's why she thinks, no, 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 no. We're all psychosomatic. Psyche, soma, mind, body, mind, body. Our thoughts impact our bodies. This month, Men's Health Magazine did a complete story on the various 
thought forms and how they affect your body, which I thought was really interesting. That when you are thinking happy, positive thoughts, or when you're thinking negative, distracting thoughts, how it affects your body. When I first handed out the original 250 complaint-free bracelets in 2006, there was a man sitting there, and I'd never met him before. His name is Tom Allier. Tom suffered from chronic migraines his entire adult life. And I didn't know this. But every night, he would come home from work, and his wife, Misha, would say, how was your day? And he would say, on a scale of 1 to 10, my head hurt a 6. Did she ask him about his headaches, yes or no? What'd she say? How was your day? And he's giving her the headache report. So Tom realized he always had to have a headache so he and Misha would have something to talk about. Tom decided that he was no longer going to complain about his headaches when he had them. That was it. He just wasn't going to go around and tell people. Tom hasn't had a migraine in seven years. Tom is the president of our nonprofit, A Complaint Free World. Our goal is to get 60 million bracelets out. That's 1% of the world's population. If we feel that we can positively impact 1% of the world's population, it'll have a ripple effect to everyone else. Our minds and our bodies are connected. What we say, our bodies hear. I was once asked to visit a woman in the hospital. And before I went into her room, I did what I always do. I stopped at the nurse's station, and I asked the nurse how she's doing. And as luck would have it, her doctor was actually standing there. So I asked her, I said, how is Jane doing? She said she's fine. She's had a mild stroke. She will not have any uh, adverse, uh, enduring uh, challenges from it. She'll be fine within three days. She'll be going home. And I knocked on her door, and I hear this voice from the other side. And the voice goes, Come in. So I walked in. I said, Jane, it's Will, Will Bowen. And she said, thank God you're here. I'm dying. <laughs> now, I thought that maybe the doctor had, hadn't gotten in to tell her that she was OK. So I, I told her, I said, no, 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 Jane, you're going to be fine. I just talked to your doctor. You're going to be going home in three days. You're going to be fine. You'll fully recover. <sighs> she said. I'm dying. About that time, her doctor walked in. And she said, Jane, hon, I told you, you're not dying. She said, you've had a mild stroke. You'll recover fully. You'll be home playing with your cat, Tommy, in three days. You'll be fine. And she said, thank you. As soon as the doctor walked out of the room, she said, could you get a pen and a piece of paper? I said, why? She said, we have to plan my funeral. I'm dying. Ten days later, I officiated at her funeral. Our minds and our bodies are connected. When we complain about our health, our body makes darn sure we have something to complain about. Complaining keeps us focused on the problem. It's damaging to our health. It is extremely damaging to our relationships. However you describe someone, that person will be that way for you. Let me say that again. However you choose to describe someone, that person will be that way for you. And so what we do is we sit there and we wait for that other person to change, not realizing that we're adding negative energy to how they are and perpetuating it. Let me give you a, a great example. There's some women I know in Kansas City. They get together every Thursday night for what they call group therapy. Group therapy means they go to a Mexican restaurant, drink lots of margaritas, and complain about the men in their lives. From what I understand, the common theme is all men are dogs. Now, if you've just spent two hours complaining to your friends that all men are dogs, it is not surprising you see Old Yeller sitting in the Lazy Boy when you get home. <laughs> 
These women now are invested in this negative concept, and so they are looking for challenging things that they can then talk to. Well, you're not going to believe what Fred did this week. i got to write this one down. And so they're always focusing on the negative aspects, and they're repeating it, and as a result, the men are that way for them. How you describe someone is how that person is going to be for you. Complaining is damaging to relationships, not only because we complain about someone, but even complaining to someone. I mean, really, think about it. You're sitting there, you come home, at the end of the day, you've had a particular challenge yourself, you sit down with your, your spouse or your partner, and you open a bottle of wine, and all of a sudden, they turn into Eeyore. Oh, God. Let me tell you about my day. Ugh. You know, it's really funny. I think all of us want somebody in a relationship that we can complain to, but we want that person to always be happy and upbeat. <laughs> and yet here we are taking them down into negative town with our comments. In 1939, almost 100 years ago, a Dr. Gillian was looking to try and figure out why some marriages failed and some marriages succeeded, why some marriages were happy and some marriages were not. And he interviewed other psychiatrists, he interviewed uh, ministers, he interviewed social workers all over the United States, and he discovered one common thing in unhappy marriages. Anybody want to take a wild guess what it was? Complaining complaining because it creates an atmosphere of negativity within the relationship. Somebody asked me the other day, <laughs> the other day, they said, how do you have a happy relationship? I said, you know, they figured out how to do that. You take two happy people and put them together. <laughs> Beyond that, you're stuck. So as we become happier ourselves and as we talk about what's good in our lives, the relationship, which is always 50% us, gets better itself. So complaining keeps our focus on the problem. Complaining is damaging to our health. It's destructive to our relationships. And it limits your career success. It limits your career success. You ever written out a job description? Does it say on there, must complain frequently? <laughs> of course not. Because you want to work with and be around happy, upbeat people. You can teach most people just about anything. But great attitudes, they're precious as diamonds. I was speaking to the human resource professionals in Canada a while back. And after I spoke, a woman came up to me and she said, you know, I'm the HR director for one of the largest companies in Canada, an insurance company. And she said, I just fired a woman who has 25 years seniority, and she is the best producer in her group. I said, why'd you fire her? She said, because she's negative. She said, I can go through a great process of hiring a terrific person, make sure they have a great attitude, but boy, as soon as I put her, them around her, then they start taking it on, and the whole department goes down. So she fired her. When I was in my early 20s, I was working with a friend of mine who actually got several other friends to bankroll him in buying his first radio station. He bought one in a small market outside of a larger market. And within 10 years, his company had 12 radio stations, and they were all producing very well. And I said, Harold, how do you do this? How do you have success in different formats, in different towns, with different competitors, every single time? How do you do it? He said, three words. Actually, it's probably four. No weeds in my garden, five. No weeds in my garden. No weeds in my garden. Got weeds? It limits your career success. One of the things that I appreciate about what I've been able to do is to go around is I've gotten to speak to some of the highest executives in this country as well as in China. 
And what I notice is that the higher you go up, the better the attitude in most cases. If the attitude is good on top, the attitude is good throughout. Okay, so if complaining keeps your focus on the problem, damages your health, is destructive to your relationships, and limits your career success. Before I leave this one, let me tell you one more wonderful story about this. There's a man, anybody here from Houston, Texas? There's a man named Alden Clark. He owns a hair salon in Houston, Texas. He noticed that the women who worked there would cut people's hair and then they would go into the break room and they would complain about the very same women who just paid them to cut their hair. And he said he would go in there and you could feel the negativity. So on January 1st, a couple of years ago, he went down, he found a hardware store that was open. He bought five gallons of purple paint. He painted the walls inside the break room purple and he wrote a complaint-free world on the wall. Now, when he did this, everybody started talking about it. He gave them copies of the book that you all have, A Complaint-Free World. He gave them purple bracelets. He said, we are a complaint-free hair salon. We don't complain when we're here. You can complain at home. We talk about solutions, not problems. We do not gripe about one another. And we certainly don't gripe about customers. After two weeks, his top three producers came up to him and they said, you either change this stupid policy or we quit. Now, as he looked at them, he calculated in his mind how much each of them produced and meant for the salon. It was about $160,000. He said that was the longest walk he'd ever had to the door. But he walked to the door, he held it open, and he said goodbye. He then began to hire people to replace them, and what he did was he took them all into the break room, they all saw the complaint-free world, they all got bracelets, they all read the book, and he said, if you go, and we'll talk more about this, 21 consecutive days without complaining, he says, I will give you a week's salary. Last time I was in Houston, I stopped by to see Alden, but he wasn't there. He was traveling the world. His salon now does about $2 million a year, one salon, simply because he set a policy of I will only have people who are not weeds in my garden. All right, so if complaining does all of this stuff, why do we complain? Have you ever thought about that? Dr. Robin Kowalski at Clemson University wrote her doctoral thesis on complaining. And she said that people complain for one of five reasons, and I've got a little mnemonic device to help you remember it. And I'm also going to talk with you about how to get people to stop complaining. Would you like that? Okay, good. So here we go. Why do people complain and how to get them to stop? People complain for one of five reasons. And by the way, before we go forward, I need to just inform you of something. By simply hearing me speak today, you are going to notice complaints like you have never noticed before. <laughs> if you're like me and you remember, I'm 54, you remember the days when everybody smoked? Everybody, I can remember, I had asthma and my mother took me to the doctor and both she and the doctor have cigarettes and I can't understand why I can't breathe. <laughs> and nowadays, very rarely do you smoke, and certainly not in public places, but when I go to Asia, it, you notice it, right? So what I'm telling you is you're already surrounded by a funk of complaining, and you're going to notice it after hearing me speak even more, but you're going to be able to categorize each of the complaints, and you'll be able to understand why the person is complaining and ideally help them meet their needs so they'll, they'll discontinue. So the acronym that I came up with is G-R-I-P, anybody want to guess what the last letter is? E. e. People complain first and foremost to get attention. People complain to get attention. What they really want to do is they want to get your attention. They want to talk to you. They want to connect with you, but they have absolutely no idea how to do it. Human beings are social animals. 
We feel uncomfortable if someone does not recognize us. That is why elevators can be very difficult. You get on an elevator with somebody you don't know, and you both just until one of you complains about the weather, local sports team, whatever it is, and then all of a sudden you can just feel this, oh, okay, we've acknowledged each other, we can talk to each other. Hey, notice me should be tattooed on everybody's forehead. And I got plenty of real estate for it. <laughs> Everybody wants to be noticed. Everybody wants other people to pay them attention. Your students want to be paid attention. Your teachers, your staff, everyone there wants attention. There's a wonderful book out right now called The Charisma Myth, which I highly recommend, but I can give you the whole book in, in this sentence. Here we go. They have determined what charisma is. Charisma is power plus warmth plus attention. Let me say that again. Power which you have. If you're in a relationship, you have power in the relationship simply because you're part of the relationship. If you're a teacher, if you're a principal, you have power. If you then give people your attention, look them in the eye, stop texting, stop looking past them, stop, look them in the eye and smile. Just smile. Then it makes that person feel like you are truly paying them attention and you all of a sudden go from being a leader to a charismatic leader. And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody wants to be noticed. When I spoke to this human resource professionals in Canada, we did a book signing afterwards and it was a really big group. So what they did was they brought in a bookstore from Canada. It's called Chapters. It's kind of like Barnes and Noble down here and there's a whole bunch of stores in Canada. So I'm talking, I'm getting ready to go on, and I'm talking to the manager of the bookstore. His name was Pierre. I said, so uh, how's your store doing? Just trying to start a conversation. He said, our store's doing great. He says, we are the number one chapters bookstore in the country. He said, we outperform every other chapter store based on a square footage per dollar, three to one. I said, wow, you must be in a great location. He says, no, as a matter of fact, we're in a terrible location. I said, then you must be in an affluent area of town. He says, no, we're in a very depressed area of town. I said, okay, I give up. How are you able to sell so many books compared to other stores? He said, I came up with a little thing a few years ago and it seems to be working. He said, whenever someone comes within 10 feet of one of my employees, the employee is required to say, hi. And that's it. That's it. He says, it's not unusual for somebody coming in my store to be greeted 16 times in 20 minutes. And I said, my gosh, doesn't that make people feel like you're trying to sell them something? And he looked at me like, you poor, naive old man. He said, we are trying to sell them something. We're a bookstore. They came in to buy something. We're just acknowledging the most basic of human needs, which is what? What does a G stand for? Let me hear everybody say it, please. Get attention. People just want to get attention. Think of your children, both students and your children. Think of how they come to you to complain when really what all they want you to do is to turn and look at them, to talk to them, to use some of that focused charisma, to have some warmth and some attention, to look at them. People complain to get attention. So what do you do if you've got somebody who's coming to you to complain to get attention? I'm going to give you a magic phrase. So what's going well with whatever? Somebody com comes to you to complain about somebody at work. Well, what, what's going well in your department? What do you like? What do you, what's going well in your classroom? What's going well with the other people? And they will look at you like you're crazy because they have just sat there and told you everything that's going wrong simply to get their attention and you turn it around and say, but what's going well? What's going well? No, no, seriously, what's going 
well. And as you ask this question over and over again, what is going well, one of two things will happen. Either number one, they'll begin to tell you what's going well, or number two, they'll get so frustrated talking to you, they'll walk away and either way you win. People want to get attention. It is a basic human need. If you can figure out how to give people attention, if you can look them in the eye, if you can talk to them, if you can ask them questions, you will find that they're not always going to be coming to you with this challenge and with this difficulty. So the acronym is GRIPE. The G stands for? Get attention. The R stands for remove responsibility. What do you want from me? I have an 18-year-old daughter. She just graduated from high school. Why, why didn't you turn your homework? Well, the teacher didn't, and my friend was supposed to, and, you know, the dog ate. People complain them to remove themselves from responsibility. What do you want from me? It's impossible. I couldn't have done it. There's no way they complain to remove themselves from responsibility. They're saying, we can't do that. You can't fight City Hall. Nobody ever listens. Why even try? Have you ever had somebody come to you and complain about a situation? And so what you do is you go, because you're a nice person, right? Right? Yeah. So you're a nice person. You say, well, you know, have you thought about this? And so you tell them. And what do they do? They tell you why that won't work, right? So still being a nice person, you say, well, have you tried this? And they tell you why that won't work. They're not looking for a solution, friends. They're looking to try and convince you to be on their side that it's impossible. They're building an alliance. They're complaining to you as to why they can't do it. They're trying to remove themselves from responsibility. So here's the question you ask that kind of person. If you've got somebody who is coming to you and telling you it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done, your response is, if it were possible, if it were possible, how would you do it? If it were possible, how would you do it? Now, I'll be honest with you, this I got from Tony Robbins, and it is magic. It seems like people would get kind of you know, put off or whatever, but it's amazing. You just completely uh, uh, sidetrack them and get them actually thinking about how it's possible to do it. If you just keep saying, yeah, 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 I get that. But if it were possible, how would you do it? In Napoleon Hill's wonderful book, Think and Grow Rich, the greatest uh, self-improvement book, in my opinion, of all time, he talks about how Henry Ford wanted a car that had a 12-cylinder cast from a same block engine. So one block, 12 cylinders. And so Ford announced that this was going to happen. And then the engineers came to him and told him why there was absolutely no way it could happen. Ford continued to tell everybody it was going to happen. The engineers came to him again and they said, we tried this and let me tell you why structurally this is impossible and let me tell you why this is wrong. And Ford sat there, and at the end, he said, those are some of the best reasons I've ever heard for why we can't do it. Now go do it anyway. And they did. And they did. So when you get someone complaining to you to remove themselves from responsibility, your response is, say this with me, if it were possible, how might you do it? If it were possible... You're not saying it is possible. You're not arguing with them. You're not disagreeing. You're simply saying, hypothetically, if it were possible, how would you do it? Now, before I change the slide, the G in gripe stands for? Yes. Get attention. The R stands for? Remove responsibility. Remove responsibility. And the I stands for inspire envy or brag. Think about it. You don't complain about people like you. You complain about people who aren't like you. You don't think I'm telling the truth? Try it when you're driving. If, if you're a kind of person who tends to drive very slow and very cautious, then people like me will stress you. 
And if you're a person like me, I tend to drive like five miles over the speed limit, you know? And, and people who are just like slow and cautious, I'm like, ugh. Oh. But somebody goes zipping by me, and I'm like, ah, that, that person knows where they're going. I used to have an assistant who uh, would drive me to the airport. And it was amazing because we would be driving to the airport, and I tend to drive quickly, she drives slowly, and I'm sitting there in the car, and I'm thinking, would you please speed up? Gum wrappers are passing us, for goodness sake. <laughs> and she was every bit as unhappy with my driving, because sometimes I would drive, and there would be claw marks in the dashboard. When you complain about another person, what you are saying is, I don't have that particular character flaw. Get it? And I'm bragging. By the way, this is why gossip is complaining. I realize I lost some of you at that point. Gossip is complaining. When people get together to gossip, and here's, by the way, this is a very common question. People always ask me, do men or women gossip more or the other? What they have found is that it's pretty well equal, actually. And then some studies have actually shown that men complain more than women, or gossip more than women do. But when people are gossiping about somebody, they're not trying to tell you about that person. They're trying to tell you what is wrong with that person to create an invidious comparison so that you look at them and then you go, wow, you must be pretty cool to even put up with him as terrible as he is or she is or they are or whatever. It's bragging. It's a way of trying to put yourself up by putting someone else down. It's all relative. Any of y'all see the movie Hitch with Will Smith, Kevin James? Raise your hand, please. I love that movie. It has a great example of complaining for bragging in that movie. In the movie, Kevin James is dating a woman who's supposed to be like an heiress, like a Paris Hilton, very nice woman. And she takes him to a party. And at the party, they run into two of her aristocrat friends. And she says to the first one, how is that new restaurant that just opened in Manhattan? He goes, disgusting, disgusting. And you just feel the energy go down. So she turns to the other man and she says, well, how was the art gallery opening down over in, uh, in uh, the Bronx? And he goes, disgusting, disgusting. See, these guys aren't really trying to convey information. What they're saying is, my standards are so high that even an art gallery opening in New York City and a new restaurant in Manhattan, they're disgusting. They're complaining to brag. So what do you do if you've got somebody who is complaining to brag? Compliment the opposite. Say that, because it sounds funny. Compliment the opposite. Now, let me explain to you what that means. Someone comes to you and says, she's always turning her work in late. You say, you know what I really appreciate about you is that you always turn your work in on time. Can you believe the way he is dressed? You know what I love about you? You always dress so appropriately. <laughs> They're fishing for a compliment anyway. You might as well give it to them <laughs> and not have to sit there and listen. That's all they want. They are bragging to try and make themselves superior and the other person inferior. So compliment the opposite. What does the G in gripe stand for, please? Get attention. Get attention. The R stands for? The I stands for? And the P stands for? Power. Boy, this is common. You will see this in families. Someone will come and complain to you about Cousin Shirley. Why are they doing this? In case it ever comes down to you, them against Cousin Shirley, they want you on their side. People do this at work. They complain about people at work as a way of building a case against this other person. So should it ever come down to them against this other person, you'll side with them. 
We see complaining in the United States um, used uh, for power about every four years. <laughs> now, seriously, if you are an ardent supporter of one political party, does the other political party really believe that they can run a negative ad and you'll see the light and change parties? Of course not. They're not that stupid. They're trying to depress you so much with your own party that you don't vote and then they move one step closer to the White House. It's used for power. I was going to Washington, D.C. to speak. And normally I will have a driver or something like that pick me up. In this particular case, I was using a super shuttle. You know what I'm talking about? They, they'll pick you up at the airport, but then they stop at every hotel, which is fine. I wasn't in any particular hurry. But I got off the plane, and it was a really warm day in D.C. It was, it was a fairly atypical, because it was like April, but it was still really warm. It was 85 degrees. So I go, and I get my bags, and I bring them to the driver. The driver opens the back of the van, puts my bags in, comes around, holds the door for me, and the van is completely full except for one seat. Now, I go to get in, and I look at the person I'm going to be sitting next to. Now, what did I say the temperature was? 85 degrees. The guy who I'm going to be sitting next to is wearing a three-quarter length wool coat, three-quarter length wool coat, buttoned all the way up the front. Gloves that came up to his elbows, and not one, but two ski masks. His face looked like a double matted picture frame. At first, I'm thinking, there's a celebrity. They're incognito. How cool. Who could it be? Then I got to thinking, this guy looks creepy. <laughs> because I had just left the airport where I was told that the terrorist threat level was at orange, and they want me to sit next to the terrorist poster child. <laughs> Not only that, the guy kept looking at me and saying, what time is it? Time to get off the van. <laughs> um, <laughs> come to find out, he was on his way to do the Jim Bohannon radio show, which is a show I had done very recently before that. So we were talking about this, and he said he was an author. And I said, I'm an author, too. And I said, well, tell me about your book. And he said, well, I work for one of the two major political parties. Both Republicans and Democrats have these guys. He says, my job is to dig up everything that is negative about the other person, the other candidate. And he said, my job is to have storyboards and everything ready to go so we can have spots on like that. He said, my job is dirty, I'm not putting words in his mouth, my job is dirty campaigning. And he says, I have written a how-to book on negative campaigning. And he said, what's your book about? <laughs> we didn't have a lot to talk about after that. But I did say, man, it's 85 degrees. Why are you dressed like that? He said, it's the weirdest thing. I used to live in Washington. He says, now I live in Florida. He said, I have developed this convulsive asthma that when I am here in DC, I can't breathe. He says, I've, I've had to be hospitalized twice, but if I cover myself, whatever pathogen or whatever it is that gets to me, I'm okay. And I thought, your job is to foul the airwaves and you can't breathe. Dude, you make your own lunch. You make your own lunch. People complain for power. Notice this. Notice this at your schools. Notice this at school meetings, board meetings, PTA. It, and the thing is, a person who is complaining for power, let me just be very honest with you, they don't realize they're doing that. Any more than a person who is complaining to get attention realizes that they are complaining to get attention. 
But a person who is complaining to power for power really thinks that what they're conveying to you is very important and is the way to go. So you acknowledge that, but you don't get caught up in it. And if you've got two people that are arguing over an issue, the worst thing you can do is get involved. Here's what you do if you've got a person who is complaining for power. Refuse to get involved. It's just that simple. There's an old saying, if two gorillas are fighting in the jungle, stay out of the jungle. My mother, God bless her, she had three sons. And we would come to her with, you know what Chuck did? You know what Will did? You know what David did? <laughs> All the time, because we don't want mama on our side, right? My mother was brilliant. You know what she would always say? I'm Switzerland. I love you all equally. Sounds to me like you have something to talk about. And that is great advice. If you've got someone who is complaining to you, remember what is complaining. It is not completing to speak directly and only to the person who can resolve the issue. This person needs to be talking to the other person, but instead they're talking to you to gain some sort of perceived power in the situation. So your response should be, Sounds to me like you guys have a lot to talk about. And just keep saying that. Sounds to me like you have a lot to talk about. If you want, I'll sit here while you talk about it. Go get them. But you handle it. Let's go back to our acronym. The G stands for? Get attention. The R stands for? Remove responsibility. The I stands for? Inspire Envy, the P stands for? Power. And the E stands for Excuse Poor Performance. People complain to excuse their poor performance. Now, this is very much like remove responsibility, but remove responsibility is saying, this is why I shouldn't even try. You get it? Remove responsibility says, the cards are stacked against me, I can't do it. Excuse poor performances after they have already performed poorly, and then they start rationalizing. Let me say that again. They tell themselves and you rational lies, rational lies as to why they didn't succeed. One in three planes today are going to be delayed or canceled. However, the airline's safety is better than it ever has been. I don't know about you, but I'll take laid over dead any day. <laughs> and yet, it's amazing how people complain. I was in Memphis, Tennessee one day in a... Uh, I was sitting having dinner, and it was a, it, it, we were at a restaurant. The restaurant was full, so I sat at the bar, and I was sitting next to a guy, and we struck up a conversation. He was a traveler, and I was a traveler. So we're talking about traveling and everything. And then there was a, some people right down the bar who had been on, the same, had been on a plane that he was on, and they were complaining about the service. They were complaining about the timing. They were complaining about this. And he looked at me, and he said, you can always tell people who don't travel a lot because they get personally indignant over something that is totally impersonal and happens to everybody pretty much all the time. And the more you travel, the more it happens to you. I was flying to New York City one time to meet with my publisher, and I'm sitting there on the plane, and it was time for us to take off, and yet they hadn't even done the pre-flight. They hadn't even showed us, you know, I, I was lost. They hadn't shown me how to put a seatbelt on. So we're, we're sitting there, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. Now, I travel so much, what I do is I load my computer up with movies that I don't mind watching over and over and over again. So I'm sitting there watching movies. I'm happy. The flight attendant comes on, and she says, ladies and gentlemen, the FAA requires that all flight crews have a mandatory amount of downtime. She said that our flight crew got in late last night. And as a result, they had to not come to work until they had met the FAA requirement. They're here, and we're going to be taking off real soon. And people all around me started complaining. You know what I thought? I want a pilot who's well-rested. 
I don't want to be sitting back there wondering if he or she is going. <laughs> so we move out onto the, tap, the jetway. We go out onto the, the, the takeoff, the, the runway and all this, and we're there. And the pilot comes on, and he tells us we're next in line to, to take off. And so we're sitting there, and then we're sitting there, and then I see other planes taking off. And actually, I saw this. There was a jet that went around us to go around to get to the main runway. And the pilot came on the microphone, and the pilot went, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Have you noticed pilots do that, by the way? I think they teach them that in flight school. Uh. Uh, we've got a bit of a problem with one of the generators. We're going to go back to the gate, see if we can get it fixed. We'll keep you informed. You know what everybody's doing around me? Complaining. You know what I'm thinking? I'm glad they figured this out on the ground. <laughs> so, so we go back, and I am sitting there, and I'm watching movies, happy guy, but I notice that the guy sitting two seats to my left pulls out his cell phone, and I guess he wants to tell somebody something, so he starts to make a call. This is, this is the conversation this guy had. Hello? Hey. No, as a matter of fact, we haven't taken off yet. Well, the, you know, the FAA requires that uh, uh, flight crews have a certain amount of downtime. Our crew got in late last night, and then they discovered a problem with the plane, so they're fixing it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'll call you when I get there. I love you, too. Bye. Was that complaining, yes or no? no. Good. It's stating facts. Neutral. That's it. Stating facts. Big guy sitting in the seat right in front of me, I guess heard the other guy, pulls out his cell phone. <laughs> this is his conversation. No. Not even a hello. <laughs> no. Of course not. <laughs> of course. Well, the pilot, better known as Sleeping Beauty, got here late. Then they discovered a problem with this piece of junk airplane, and what's going to happen? I'm going to miss my connection. That's what's going to happen. Well, if I miss my connection, then no, I'm not going to see the client. Honey, if I miss my connection and I don't see the client, then the sale is not going to happen. That's right. We will not be going to Jamaica. I know because I know. Look, I'm going to miss my connection. There's nothing. Look, I'll call you if I get there. Goodbye. Same question. Was that complaining? Yes. Yeah, that was complaining. About five minutes later, pilot comes on. He said, we've resolved the issue with the plane, and he says, I've got good news. We have managed to arrange for connecting flights for everyone on board, except two people. <laughs> and he calls out the names, and the guy sitting in front of me jumps up, grabs his rollerboard, and goes, of course, storms off. And I'm thinking, buddy, you what? You make what? Your own lunch. You make your own lunch. By the way, of course, greatest example of whether you're a positive or negative person is how you use the words of course. Because if you haven't figured this out yet, every day something's going to go wrong. Every day something is going to go wrong. And if you go, of course, you are saying to the universe, order up. Send me more. <laughs> of course. But you know what? Yeah, so something's going to go wrong. Most things are not going to go wrong. Most things are going to go well. And so if you look at it and you go, when the good things happen, of course. Of course. I am the king of parking spots, by the way. Because I visualize and always 
get a parking spot. I was, we had a book launch for my book last week, and it was funny because I didn't get there early and there was no place to park. And so I'm driving around with one of the people that I interviewed in the book, and he's like trying to help me find a space. And you know what I said? I'm tired of looking for a space. I'm going to create one right in front. And I heard him kind of go, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I did. And you know what I said? Of course. Of course. By the way, twin sister to of course is just my luck. If you go, oh, just my luck, or just my luck. It really is that simple. I wish I could complicate it. I could probably write 10 more books and make more money. But it's not that difficult. It's simply changing how you see things and changing that, more importantly, what you say about things. What you say about things. So if you've got somebody who's complaining to excuse poor performance. Now remember, this has already happened. So you say, how do you plan to improve next time? How do you plan to improve next time? The worst thing you can do is sit there and do a post-mortem on everything that didn't work out in their favor because trust me, whatever question you've got, they've got answers for as to why it is not their fault. So if you say, how do you plan to improve next time, then that puts their focus on doing better next time and sets them up to be accountable next time sets them up to be accountable. So one more time, the G in gripe stands for? The R stands for? The I? Or brag. The P stands for? And the E stands for? I have been traveling around the world. I have spoken to a lot of people. And I can tell you that every complaint will fall under one of those five categories or more. Somebody may be complaining to get attention and excuse their poor performance at the same time. There are some people out there who are ninjas at complaining. And have you ever noticed that complaining is a competitive sport? Have you ever noticed that complaints always go in lesser to greater severity? You're sitting around with some friends and you say, you know, I was, I was playing baseball the other day and I, I messed up my thumb. And somebody else will say, isn't that odd? I was walking and I slipped on some ice and I pulled my hamstring. And the next person says, well, you know what? I was skiing and I, I tore three sets of ligaments in my knee. Now, can you imagine somebody going, yesterday I went and got a manicure and they messed up one of my nails after somebody just told you about tearing three sets of ligaments in their knee? <laughs> I don't think so. You're laughing because we don't do that. It goes the other way. You start off with the manicure messed up and then you get to the torn ligaments. Complaining is a competitive sport. That's why we need to nip it in the bud as early as possible. Now I've shared with you some tips as to how to get people who complain, the five reasons to get them to stop now I'm going to talk to you about the most important person to get to stop complaining, and that is you. That is you. You have a complaint-free bracelet. You received one when you got here. It says a complaint-free world on it. Now, this is not a bracelet that you wear to support our cause. This is not something you go, I support a complaint-free world. People are like, well, it starts at home. This is a tool. The idea behind the complaint-free bracelet is every time you catch yourself complaining, you take it off one wrist and you move it to the other wrist. Now, it's just that simple. Every time, let me make sure your bracelets work. Let me see you do it. I want to make sure we didn't get any bad bracelets here. Just take it off, switch it to the other risk. Because the idea is to go 21 consecutive days without complaining. Why 21 consecutive days? Well, scientists have found that it takes approximately 21 days to form a new habit. And right now, complaining is a habit for you. So we're trying to get you to go 21 consecutive days without complaining. Now, before you take off your bracelet, stick it in your pocket. 
I want you to understand that there have been tens of thousands of people that I know of who have emailed me and contacted me who have said they have done this. There was a woman who flew from California to Kansas City to see me because she and her husband had filed for divorce. They got complaint-free bracelets. They decided they would do two things. Number one, they would not complain to each other. Number two, they would not complain about each other. She flew to Kansas City to thank me. I thought a phone call would do. <laughs> but that was extremely sweet. That's how big it was. This is the simplest and yet most profound thing I have ever discovered. I feel so fortunate that I was guided to present this to the world. Because I didn't know what all this was going to do. There's a high school girls flag team in Missouri. They would go to the state competitions and they had never placed in a state competition in over a decade of having a flag team. You know what I mean by band? You have the band and then you have the flag girls? That year, one of the co-captains of the team heard about the complaint-free movement. She got complaint-free bracelets for everybody on her team. They agreed that they would not complain to each other. They would not complain about each other. That year, they won state and national. That was the only thing they did different. So the idea is to go 21 consecutive days and to switch your bracelet with every spoken complaint. I have known some very... Um, excited people who are like, well, I'm going to switch it with every negative complaint, I think. I'm thinking, good luck. That'll be nonstop. Trust me. You want to move it every time you speak a complaint. You simply take it off one wrist, you put it on the other wrist. Right now, you have your bracelets on, you're on day one for 21 days. As soon as you complain, not if, as soon as you complain, You'll switch it to the other wrist and you'll be on day one. It's really that simple. Now here's what typically happens. You're on day one, and then you're on day one. And if you're lucky, you're on day one, and it goes day one, day one, day one, day one, day two, day one. Day one, day one, day one. Day two, day three, day four, day one. Most people take four to eight months to go complaint free. Always know what day with your, you're on and stay with it because it typically takes four to eight months. But you know what? The time's going to pass anyway. And no great change in your life happens like that. We live in a culture that wants a pill or an injection. I can't give you one, but I've given you a tool that if you will just switch it every time, every time you complain, every time you complain, and don't feel bad when you complain. That's what's amazing to me. People will, will write me emails and they'll say, I messed up, I switched my bracelet. And I'm like, you didn't mess up, you succeeded. You had no idea you were even complaining before. Now you're becoming aware of the fact that you are complaining. So every time you complain, you switch it. By the way, I will give you a few tips on this. No, you can't wear a bracelet on each wrist, so you're covered. <laughs> I actually had a woman call me the other day, she said, Okay, I just complained, and I said, uh-huh. She said, so I get the rest of the day as a free day, right? <laughs> no. You start over immediately as soon as you do it. And by the way, don't snap your bracelet. People say, I'm going to snap mine. I say, yeah, that's, that's a great way to inspire yourself to positive change. Do violence to yourself. <laughs> No, you just you want to be aware. And people are like, oh, I'm moving mine so many times. The average person complains 15 to 30 times a day and has no awareness of it. Let me say that again. They complain 15 to 30 times a day and have no awareness of the fact that you're doing it. They're doing it. So what we want to do is to make you aware of it. Now, the book that you all received, A Complaint-Free World, is broken into four segments, and I want to cover these real quickly so they don't completely throw you when you start reading it. The four segments are 
there, there's an um, um, instructor at Harvard University, his name is not coming to me, but he was the one that isolated the fact that every time we try to become proficient at anything, we always go through four stages. Number one is unconscious incompetent. You may not believe this, but one of my hobbies is juggling. And it's amazing to me how I'll be juggling in a park or something, and somebody who has never juggled before will come up, and they'll pick up the balls or the clubs, and they'll go like this, and they'll fall on the floor, and then you or the ground, and then they realize, well, I guess I can't juggle. But they didn't know until they tried. Unconscious incompetent means that you're complaining. You're incompetent, you're complaining, but you're unconscious of it. You have absolutely no awareness of it. And that's where you were before you put on the bracelet. Now that you put the bracelet on, this is the tough one. Conscious incompetent. <laughs> Man, stop me before I complain again. I'm tired of switching this bracelet. And by the way, I switched mine so many times, people thought I had a nervous problem. <laughs> Why is he always doing this? Local television show came to interview me right after we started doing this, and I had switched mine so many times that the rubber had gotten kind of like worn, and they're interviewing me live on television, and I say, well, let me show you how to change the bracelet. I go to do this, and my bracelet was so worn, it popped and flew over the cameraman's head. You will change your bracelet back and forth. You just stay with it. I have discovered that these bracelets only don't work if you put them in a drawer. And what's amazing to me, this, is, this just blows me away. I get this one all the time. You know, when my life gets better, I'm going to do that whole complaint-free thing. <laughs> you know what I say? That's like saying, when I get in great shape, I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> this is the thing that makes your life great because you're not getting up and complaining and talking about everything that is wrong. My newest book is called Happy Stories. It just came out last week. My publisher, uh, which is a division of Amazon, asked me to find 50 of the happiest people in the world and interview them and find common things about them. And it's an attitude. The word happiness, uh, psychiatrists, by the way, they don't like the word happiness. They, they, they like subjective well-being which means I decide it's subjective and it's well-being. I decide how happy I am. One of the people that I interview in this book, her name is Gwen Moliere. She was in um, New Orleans. She drove school bus for a living. She did not make much money. And when Hurricane Katrina came through, she spent five days on her rooftop. She actually saw People she knew, she saw their bodies being carried off by alligators. This woman got through this. She was relocated to Galveston, Texas, where Hurricane Ike paid her a visit. This time she lost a leg, but she is the most happy upbeat person you'll ever meet. Why? Because she's decided she's happy and she's upbeat. She looks at her life and she says, when I weigh all the negatives and the positives, I'm blessed. And when you talk to Gwen, she just keeps talking about how blessed she is. You are now in the conscious incompetent stage. You will be switching your bracelet. And by the way, I realize this is a Sam's conference, but if your Sam is here, they are not supposed to come up and say, ah, you need to move your bracelet. <laughs> Some of y'all were already planning that one. <laughs> this is not about being a bracelet cop. If they are just great, 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 and that bracelet just sits there, you be quiet. Because guess what? If you complain, if you tell them, you've got to switch your bracelet. <laughs> Unconscious incompetent, conscious incompetent, and then if we're lucky, if we stay with it, we will hit conscious 
competent. I can tell, because see, now I've been through all four of these stages. I was the first person since I started it to go 21 consecutive days. It took me four months to do it. And I thought I was the most positive, upbeat person you'd ever meet. And I was like, wow, how many times I had moved that. The conscious competence stage is the I don't want to move my bracelet stage. I know a family who all four did this at the same time. They said that they hit the conscious competence stage all at the same time. And as a result, they would sit at the dinner table with nothing to talk about. <laughs> But they got through it. And after they got through it, they found there's a lot of great stuff to talk about. It's people, people say to me, what do you talk about? You just talk. I mean, you just, there's so much good stuff to talk about. Then you stay with it. You move into unconscious competent. Unconscious competent. This is where you don't complain, and you don't need to even think about not complaining, because you have so watched yourself that you have just not complained in months. It's no longer a part of who you are. Morale trickles downhill. I got a call last week from a woman who is, uh, and we actually met and talked. She is the lead anchor on Fox 4 News. Her name is uh, Lauren Halifax in Kansas City, Missouri. Lauren and I met and we had coffee and we were talking. And she was telling me because her morning show there in Kansas City, there's four stations doing four morning shows, and they have been number one for over a decade. And yet, if you look at their set, it's inferior to everyone else's. They just seem to kind of be winging it, and yet everybody watches them. And she said, you know why? We're happy. We love each other. The four of us that are on camera and the crew and everybody love each other. And she said, people are always calling, trying to hire me away, thinking by hiring me that they're somehow going to make their station number one in the morning. She said, it doesn't work. And they say, well, we'll hire the whole staff. We'll bring them all over. And she said, just because we're happy doesn't mean we'll be happy working with you. You want happier teachers? You want happier students? You become happy. You become complaint-free first. Now, I said that through doing this, you would become a happier person. Here's why. Think of the mind as a manufacturer and the mouth as a customer. The mind manufactures a negative thought. It comes out as a complaint. Negative thought, complaint. Negative thought, complaint. When the manufacturer, rather, when the customer stops buying what the manufacturer is producing, that is, when you stop complaining, the manufacturer retools, and you become happier. I've seen it thousands of times. If you do choose to do this at your school, please share with me how it works. By the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned the curriculum is available in Spanish as well. I want to close with uh, the most common question people ask me. And I've heard this all over the world. It's usually women. They say, what's Oprah like? I'll tell you this, she's the same off camera as she is on camera. But it was so funny because when I did my segment with her, after I finished, she reached over and she grabbed my arm and she said, she called me Pastor Will. She said, Pastor Will, I have nothing to complain about. And you know what I thought? Of course not, you're Oprah Winfrey for God's sake. <laughs> going to complain about. You're one of the richest, most pop, and I'm just sitting here with Oprah. There's 400 people, you know, and all this, and, and they're in a commercial. And, <laughs> and I guess my poker face wasn't working because I kind of went. <laughs> and she said, it's not that I have everything that I have, and therefore I don't complain. Oprah says, I don't complain. That's why I have everything I have. See, Oprah gets that she makes her own lunch, as do you. So make it a magnificent buffet and share it with the world, would you?
Thank you all for your time. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.